Hello, everybody. Uh, are you all pumped up on booze and ice cream? That's how we do it in public radio. Uh, welcome to KPCC TV. I'm Rico Galliano. You may know me from Dinner Party Download back in the day, uh, occasionally guest hosting on this uh, fine station. And uh, also just happy to see everybody here. How are you doing? Awesome. You are about to meet some of the most remarkable artists, technicians, and outdoorsmen in Hollywood. But first, let us just see a brief overview of how they earn their living. We're here to document the lives of people living in Alaska. The biggest challenge of shooting the show is always the environment. Winds up to 65 miles an hour, hurricane level windstorm. Working on life below zero can be very dangerous. Guns here, cameras here, never know what to expect. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> See that? In five years on Life Below Zero, this has been one of the craziest 24 hours for me, for sure. It started off well, we got some great shots, and then everything just went to hell. Definitely takes a certain breed to film up in Alaska. Half the battle is the ingenuity and in being innovative and creative. We're always trying to think of just something different. Big, integral part of our show right there. You never know what to expect out here. We have to be ready for anything. They need to get it out of here before it freezes in there, otherwise it ain't moving. Is my job this cool? Yeah, it is. This place is incredible. It's really brutal and wild and makes for really wonderful television. All right, boys, you ready for this? Do it. Yes. Oh. And now, folks, I want to introduce some of the people who make that show possible. First up, executive producer Joe Litzinger. Editor Michael Swingler is up next. And directors of photography David Lovejoy and Benji Lamfer. A few of the men up here have truly suffered for their art. Um, I, so I said it right at the top, you're all kind of multi-hyphenates, artists, technicians, and outdoorsmen. I kind of just, so that people get an idea of who you are, maybe let's go down the line, and I kind of want to know which came first, the artist or the outdoorsman. So why don't we, let's start with you, Benji. Uh, well, naturally for me, I guess, outdoorsman. Um, I grew up in Minnesota, so I kind of grew up in the cold. Do some Minnesotans some Minnesotans in, the house? in here? <laughs> all right. Uh, yeah, I grew up in Bloomington, and as you know, if you have... Uh, family or anybody who lives in Minnesota, you have a cabin. Um, so I grew up in the very cold north of Minnesota at our cabin. Um, we used to actually take snow machines in to get to our cabin, a couple miles, things like that. So you're kind of born for this job. I feel like it kind of uh, brought me back to home when I got this job. <laughs> yeah, it had been 16 years. I moved to California 16 years ago, and I hadn't been in anything like that in 16 years. And then I got on the show. Yeah, there's a reason people moved to California. Yeah, <laughs> I was trying to stay far away, and it didn't work out. Um, but it's been nice, because uh, it kind of put me back to where I grew up. I felt like um, way more harsh conditions in Minnesota, if you can believe it. Um, but it was, uh, for me, it was just bringing me straight back to what I enjoyed about Minnesota. And then, you know, basically applied exactly what I had been working towards, which was film. Um, so putting both of those together, for me, was just kind of a natural fit. How about you, Dave? Uh, kind of similar story. I'm from, uh, from Maine, from New England. And uh, I kind of grew up doing the same kind of thing. Big outdoorsy guy. Spent a lot of time hiking and camping as I was growing up. And uh, sort of fell into the career because I, I love it so much, love being outside and capturing that beauty is like a great place to start if I'm trying to look for a career. Yeah. If I can do that for a living, like why not? Uh, and I got pretty good at it, I enjoyed it, so it sort of came natural for me to, to be a part of a show like this. I, I do wonder, uh, I have, there's also been this slew of kind of mountain climbing movies, and I do wonder if mountain climbers get into photography because it's a way to get somebody to bankroll just being out all the time. <laughs> Is there some aspect of that, maybe? I would say so. Um, <laughs> I think growing up, what I was really into at first, what first brought me to having a camera skateboarding. 
and you only get into filmmaking because you, someone needs to hold the camera, and mm -hmm. uh, you you take turns with your buddy, and eventually, if you're better at uh, holding the camera than skating, you just end up being the camera guy for everything. Yeah, 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 so, yeah. I guess that's uh, what happened to me. No good at skating, so I'm here. <laughs> Uh, Michael, I know you spend most of your time indoors as an editor, but uh, do you have experience in this realm? Um, well, I, I grew up in Phoenix, Arizona. Yep. <laughs> so temperature-wise, it's the exact opposite. Instead of Just freezing, looking I'm at the burning footage. my hands on my steering wheel. <laughs> um, but I still, uh, we went up north a lot in Arizona. We, I grew up camping, hunting. Um, so I, I, I was definitely in the in the outdoors quite a bit and you know when I finally got this you know being able to work on this it was just uh, it was fantastic it was like um, you know I'm seeing on the screen all the things that I loved to do as a kid with my father and and stuff so it, uh, it's special for me. Joe? Uh, I think I'm the opposite actually of these uh, gentlemen I, I was in, in Boy Scouts and I quit because I couldn't bring TV with you. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> camping uh, or, or outdoors, I sort of... There's no up. TV badge. Uh, you know, exactly, out. there is no TV badge. Um, but, um, you know, up until... I, I, before this show, I worked on a variety of um, shows where I've traveled, traveled a lot, but um, I grew up in Texas, and, uh, you know, it's not that cold there. And the first time I went to Alaska was the first time I've ever been in negative temperatures, and it was... For this show? Yes, and it was shocking. <laughs> <laughs> tell, actually, tell us about that. Tell me that story. Sure. Uh, when we launched the show seven years ago, we um, brought a crew up there um, and uh, in Fairbanks, and we walked outside, and it was negative 30. Um, uh, what but does that even feel like? I mean, what, what physically happens? Do, like, your tears freeze before Well, these guys can talk about it more, what it feels like actually being out there, because that, you know, I felt it from the, the hotel to the car, <laughs> walking from the hotel in the car to a meeting to launch these guys, to send them out to the real yeah. conditions. Um, that but was it, the you know, But yeah, for the 10 minutes that I was in the negative temperatures, it was very cold. <laughs> Feels good. Um, let's see an example. This, uh, we, we've got about a five minute clip here of a sequence that was not shot in the cold, but there's other dangers, as you'll see, involved in shooting in Alaska. Let's roll this. The land is tough, the animals are big, the mosquitoes, the insects, Alaska, it's a whole nother level. We had a good night at the hill cabin. We're gonna head up to the family cabin now. It's about an hour up. We haven't been there since the winter with snow machine. I get to bring my kids with me, it's warmer out, they're out of school, we can travel by boat, can carry a lot more stuff, so it's gonna be fun. For Rico DeWild, passing on native traditions and survival techniques to his children is a responsibility. He's spending time with his son Skylar and daughter Scarlett in the wild, and will now take them to the family cabin upriver to show them the Athabascan way of life. This is where I learn how to live in the woods and how to get by in life. It brings back so much memories and so much history to be able to come out here with my kids. It's a beautiful feeling. Okay, I'll show you guys where I used to live when I was growing up. Okay, you guys come out. Let's go check out the cabin. Getting to the family cabin is gonna be great, but I gotta make sure there's no bears around there. I had a bear come in over the winter, so I'm hoping it didn't come back. Just stay close to me, okay? Okay. Whoa. Oh, damn, look at this. It's a bunch of bear diggings right here, you see? Look. Whoa. As soon as we got off the boat, and I go to tie the rope, big old digging marks in the ground. Not good signs. You guys stick close behind me, okay? We're gonna check the cabin. Stay right here, stay right here. Don't, don't walk in front of me, because I got a loaded gun in. One in the barrel. Another one right there. 
a lot of people see bears on TV because the ones you can film are in Kodiak or these salmon eating bears where they're jumping out and the bears are grabbing them. It looks all fun and games, but this isn't Terrier, Alaska. This isn't salmon country. This is big bear country. And these bears are real, real dangerous out here. Okay, listen. There's no noise. There's a lot of mosquitoes on here. I see it. The cabin? Yeah. That door is wide open. You see the door is open? Yeah. That means a bear came in there. Okay, be real quiet. Just listen. Can you see it? Listen. that noise because I don't want to go in there and there's something in there okay you guys will wait right here okay okay I'm gonna check the cabin just wait right here dad you need a flashlight good thinking might need it if you hear anything holler at me hear any sticks break anything like that because big big grizzly they always break sticks if they get mad Fuck the cabin up. Hey. Damn. Holy shit. Okay, out there, Scott. I can just hear birds chirping and bees being. Okay, just wait right there. Don't move, okay? What the fuck? Hey, check, check the upstairs. Guys, go, you can come in. The whole cabin is all smashed up. Dang, it did. Hope it doesn't come back at night. Yeah, I know. Whoa. Be careful what you step on, might be something sharp. Right here, you see, kids, look. There's toes, that's probably a young grizzly. You guys will have to sleep upstairs with me tonight because if he comes back around, we might have problems. Why do they want us? They just chew on everything. And if they smell food from last winter cooking, they come around. Do you see those teeth marks? A very dangerous situation here because the bear is around here and he just put the boots to my cabin. Um, doesn't even look the same. I don't know we used to sit right there and watch TV. Oh, damn. So much memories just smashed. I grew up here in this cabin for most most of my youth. It's heartbreaking, to say the least. I was hoping to get some quality time with the family, but it's basically, uh, it's a lot of work ahead of me. It smells like a rotten bear. Does he poop in here? Yeah, that's a funky bear smell in here, huh? We gotta clean this whole cabin up. I can't even live in it the way it is right now. I brought some metal metal screens I'm gonna put over the window. These boards ain't working out here. And this bear is getting a little too crazy for me. Oh man, we have so much work to do. But the cabin is still standing, so that's a good thing. Nice. So 
I can't think of a better scene to illustrate something that Benji actually mentioned to me backstage that I thought was fascinating, which is kind of the tone that sets this show apart from a lot of nature shows. Why don't you tell us about it? Uh, yeah, it's um, anything from a bear to a mosquito is dangerous out, out in Alaska. It's like, if it's not one thing, it's another. And the mosquitoes even just as much in the summertime are just as bad as the bears. <laughs> Um, but the but the tone, the way that this is shot, and the and the way that it's edited, right? And the way that they explain that, you know, has it, you know from the very beginning, I guess, from when I started the show, man, it's been five and a half years now. Um, and I always shout out Joe Boots, who was our original DP, who kind of created the look for the show, uh, and that was to be shot like a like a horror story, uh, like a horror film, very tight, very wide, build the suspense. Um, peek around corners with the camera and the lens. It's how we shoot it, and it's especially how it's edited as well. Yeah, I was going to ask you, Michael, so what what in the editing of this is kind of horror-esque that you like would take from the horror world and put into this? Um, I mean, I, I think the key thing is just tension. Um, you know, the, it, it's all about building the anticipation of them even before they get to the door. Um, if they just approach and they say, oh, there's a bear inside, and they immediately go inside, there's no bear. <laughs> <laughs> but, Spoiler alert, there is no bear. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, and, and as Benji said, it's like, take this approach of it being a horror film. So uh, the editing has to, uh, and initially it's, it's long, drawn-out shots, wide, things are sort of obscured, um, showing reactions, the tension... Uh, the music, uh, you throw in that sort of horror track. Um, like a low hum almost. Low, it's the, the drone, it's the scary drone. <laughs> um, <laughs> so you, you build up all of this tension leading up to it, and as he gets closer, then the cuts start getting faster, disjointed. The music starts picking up, cutting to the kids in the outside, seeing that they're terrified, you know, is my father gonna come out mm -hmm. alive? And the key thing, I think, is really with them. It's like they don't know if there's a bear in there. Well, this was actually one of my questions. I, th you guys did not actually shoot this scene. But did, I mean, I'm, I don't know if you like assign the scene to be shot, but did people know that a bear was a possibility going into that sequence? D uh, definitely in that sequence and always. I mean, Benji was um, sort of downplaying the, the dangers. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, these men and women who go out there uh, you know, we have, uh, with every shoot, we have um, a camera guy, a producer, uh, a safety person. Uh, and every time we um, do anything, uh, we try to start by thinking what could happen. Um, it is, uh, you know, uh, unscripted, uh, and we have an idea, you know, Rico knows, I'm going to go into that cabin today. It's like, well, what could be there? What could be the dangers? Um, but they absolutely are going in there with no knowledge of, one, the danger, and then, two, of the story. And th well, actually, and this story becomes kind of this actually heartwarming tale of a, them bonding as they put their home back together again. I'm sure that this happens a lot. Give me like your favorite example of what you thought a story was going to be, and then it became something totally different. For anyone on the stage. <laughs> Maybe David. <laughs> I don't think if I could think of an example right Well, now. I can talk a little bit about what happens in this story. Okay. And, and like you were sort of alluding to that, um, you know, we knew that we'd be going back. To, he was going to take his kids to the cabin. And that was sort of all we knew. He wanted to show his kids the cabin that he grew up uh, in. And there could be a bear. It could be a den. There could be, you never know. Mm -hmm. um, as you saw, a bear had, before we got there, torn up the cabin. And what ends up becoming, you know, he says, I'm going to clean up the cabin. And, you know, watching someone clean up isn't that exciting. <laughs> But what ends up happening is he ends up bonding with his kids and telling them, you know, going through each item and saying, this was my grandfather who's, um, who passed away, and explaining his Athabascan traditional uh, ways via the items that um, uh, end up, you know, that, that the bear has torn up. Yeah. And he gets emotional, um, and uh, it ends up being, like you said, a very surprisingly heartwarming story of someone cleaning up a cabin. I did, <laughs> I did want to go actually a step back though. You were talking about the safety person that's on the set at all times. Because when I'm watching that, what I see is one guy who's worried enough to have a gun in his hand and then a cameraman who's got his hands full of a camera that's really a lot less effective for defense. So what is, 
Is the safety person armed? Like, what is the safety person's job? They, they are. And, uh, you know, BBC and National Geographic obviously take safety very, very important. And these guys are and girls are out there in um, extremely dangerous conditions. But we tell them every time they go out there that nothing is worth even an injury, let alone uh, uh, their lives, and, and, and truly, truly mean it. Uh, we take safety very, very serious. And the safety guide, uh, their main job is to, to protect the crew, um, to have, you know, talk about what they think could happen, perceived risk. Do you guys agree with that? that yeah, I think uh, us as filmmakers, we kind of get uh, tunnel vision when we're actually working right there. Like, yeah. I have, I've worked on a similar scene with Rico before. The first time he goes to his cabin, and we had the same concern when we went there. And it was just to get there. It was three days through on snow machines in the winter. We didn't know how we were going to get there. We had to figure it out as we went. And he's that cabin is 40 miles away from nowhere, so yeah. basically. Uh, and, and nowhere you, is 200 <laughs> miles away from a town. Yeah. And you, you get these glimpses as you're filming this every once in a while, especially with someone like Rico, as you can look at him and tell he's lived so much of his life out there and yeah. you just take a moment to like, like we saw in that clip where he, wait, listen, and he's been in this situation so many times and you've got to sit there and think like, oh, this actually could be a bear up <laughs> yeah. there. That could, this is for real. And go through that scenario in your head and trying to figure out what am I going to do? And also, how am I going to cover that and keep it keep us safe and get some great coverage as well? Is there a protocol for that? Like, have you uh, do you have like some sort of drill or some sort of steps that you know you know if you're in a danger zone that you have different jobs to do or what? Yeah, there's a safety meeting every morning typically. Um, you know, to answer your question before your question, last question, <laughs> uh, and to add to this, um, you know, we're in a meeting every time before we go out that explains, you know, capture the authenticity of what's happening and always look for the left turn in the story. Um, and in that, you know, we try to prepare the best we can, but it's very much, you know, we're in the left turn, we mean what is actually happening, what's naturally happening. You know, if this is a story that we're telling about, you know, say Sue making a, a garden um, that could quickly turn into a bear story because there's a bear that's poaching her and her garden. And so, you know, we're always looking behind our backs to see what is actually happening around that area. Um, and in that way, you know, we're always trying to be as safe as possible. We have a safety guide who's there to kind of watch our backs. Um, but I think after a while of being up there, we're kind of, you know, I hate to say get used to it, but I think we're more in tune uh, with being in that area and knowing what, you know, what the dangers are. But it's usually the unexpected that tricks us, you know. This may be a stupid question, but you're, because you're also filmmakers and because you want to tell a story and because you're looking for the left turns, on some level, are you hoping a bear shows up? Oh yeah, for sure, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, is it really. Yeah, as, we, as many bears as possible. <laughs> I, I get excited every time they scan the horizon. We we used to. I, I I don't know if it happens as much anymore. But when the show started, we used to kind of fight for the A story. So the way that the show uh, shows the the each character is like A B C and D, and we'd always try to get the the beginning and the ending story, which meant like the A story, the showcase the one that, story, the, the showcase story, and that usually involved a bear, you know, <laughs> or, or some sort of like Wolverine or danger that happens within. Wildlife. So it's like, all right, we got the A story, you know, and kind of like, you know, rub it into the other crews that we're getting something better than they are. So then I'm, but then I'm imagining it's like, oh, great, the Wolverine, we got the Wolverine. And then it's like, on, on second thought, maybe I didn't want the Wolverine. You know, you're now confronting a Wolverine. Oh, sure. And when you're <laughs> camping, you know, it makes it hard to sleep sometimes. You know, we were camping one time by Sue's River, and there was a, uh, we were on a bear hunt, and we saw a half grizzly, half, was it black bear? Polar bear, I think. Oh, yeah, it was half, no, half grizzly, half polar bear yeah, is what it was. Too big to yeah. be a regular grizzly. It was very rare. I've never seen anything like it before. It was this golden-looking bear, and it, uh, it was running towards camp. And he had his drone up far enough away, but able to see it kind of going towards where we were camping which we happened to be camping on the river um, during this leg. So we were, I think, two and a half, three weeks camping on the river, and we were about 40 miles out where this half grizzly, half polar bear was just kind of cruising that way. And we, we heard, in one, I think it's in this episode, actually, Sue says that uh, they can cross like two miles in a, in, at a full run. It's like they're upon you in a second, basically. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're quick. And you know what's great now is we have, at the beginning... 
when we started shooting, we didn't have drones in the beginning of shooting this um, five years ago. Now we have drones. So for our safety, it's pretty easy now to, <laughs> especially in Alaska, in that time of uh, year where it's 24 hours of light, we have like a eight hour golden hour where mm -hmm. the sun is just setting on the horizon for eight hours straight, um, which is beautiful. A but it safer. also allows us to launch a drone at like two in the morning and kind of look around the area to see if that bear is coming near us. Well, let's actually, let's see a clip from the exact opposite time of year. Uh, well, maybe not the exact opposite time of year, but it's, uh, this is sort of, this is a behind the scenes in shooting the Iditarod. Uh, much colder this time of year. Let's roll it. We are here to document the lives of people living in Alaska. The harsh reality is the environment we're up against. It makes it tough to do our job. Get out of there! Working on life below zero can be very dangerous. Guns here, cameras here. Never know what to expect. Hey, hey. You see that? It's gonna be tough, but we're gonna get the shot. Every scenario, we gotta prepare for this. But we're still smiling, we're having fun. Still making life below zero. Yes! Bring it on. So 2019, I did a rod. Definitely excited to be back this year. We're just trying to uh, keep up, keep up with our boy Jesse Holmes. I'm back to the I did a rod for my second run. Last year was my rookie run. It was an incredible experience uh, for me as a dog racer. I feel like after last year, this is what I'm cut out for in my mushing career. It really changed my life, honestly. It's uh, we worked really hard for years for it. Today's the official start of the race. You gotta have all your things together because once you leave here, it's a thousand miles to know. Right. We're setting off for a 1,000 mile ride. Our goal is to just get out in front of most of the pack without having to pass many or any mushers. Film Jesse's story, see how the race evolves for him day to day. It should be pretty amazing. Get stuck. Nacho, how you doing? Are you stuck? I mean, the trail is just complete water ahead of me. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure how we get out of this. Yeah, Rob, I, maybe if you come up here, you'll you'll be on some firm enough ground to pull me out. Started off well. We got some great shots with Jesse, and then everything just went to hell. I hit this huge pocket of overflow, sunk my toe sled, my machine stopped moving, and I was just threw up my hands like, what next? Enough. So the trail basically just disintegrated around us. You're in this slush pond, and the snow machines lose traction, sleds get stuck, and we just ground to a halt. basically just keep full throttle, keep the faith, and hopefully you can keep up the momentum and make it through the ice. 30 miles of uh, horrendous overflow. Sounds like we're gonna have a really slow moving trail. You know, it's always a good day when you don't actually think you're gonna die. So it definitely could have been worse, but at least it wasn't uh, open water. Nacho and I have just arrived at the blowhole, which notoriously last year kicked our asses. And I'm gonna go inside there and we're gonna film Jesse going by. And I've been dreaming of this shot of Jesse coming through and having a camera set up in this window. He's coming pretty quick right now on the trail, so we're gonna get in there. The other tricky part is we don't have any communication with Jesse, and so he keeps turning off his headlamp to kind of just enjoy the ride. We never really know when he's coming or not. Sometimes we set up and he just goes by in the dark and we can barely see him. Don't get a shot at all, so this could be worth nothing in the end. See that light there? That's Jesse. Yeah, we got him coming. Here he comes. All right. <laughs> I did a rod. I did a rod. 2019, man. Back at it, boys. We 
finally got some sleep last night. We've been going 40 hours, 30 hours, something like that without sleep. Getting up early and doing all that we had to do to cover Jesse's race. We weren't sure whether we were going to be able to do it, but it worked out great. And we're feeling really proud that we kind of pulled this off. And we made a lot of friends along the way. Uh, it's incredible to see how people come out for this race. All the people in the villages who just come out to cheer on the mushers and see the dogs, all the kids that come out and the, the enthusiasm that they show to, to welcome people to their home. Just to have that, we're fired up, we're excited. A long trip, we were 12 days out on the trail, day and night, really. Uh, very little sleep, kind of living the life of an Iditarod musher. So we made it to Nome, over a thousand miles on the trail, safe and sound in one piece. Feels pretty amazing to be here. Really feel privileged to have been able to do this. It's a trip of a lifetime, really, and to be able to come out here and, and travel the trail, experience it. That was really special to be a part of that. There you go. So first of all, there's just there's the one shot where you know you're going to this incredible lengths to get this one shot, and then the guy that you're trying to shoot just keeps turning his light on and off. <laughs> Why did he do that to you, exactly? Oh no, it's sometimes he's messing with us. I think <laughs> um, it's funny seeing that actually. I just took a huge deep breath at the end, <laughs> which I was like, felt like I was there again. I was like, wow, we just did that. Um, yeah, no, Jesse, uh, so that was our second time on the Iditarod. That was this year, that was this March. Um, and Jesse very much wants it to be documented, but doesn't want us there, yeah. um, if that makes sense. We're friends, but on the Iditarod, uh, it's questionable. You know, <laughs> It's very much, are we friends still, or what's going on here? There's a lot of, uh, a lot of things that come into play with that, as far as sleep deprivation, uh, you're in a race, you're trying to focus, and you're also trying to make it look like nobody's there helping you because we can't help them. There's a lot of rules that we have to follow, uh, one of which they put um, just right before the race began this year that we had to stick within three hours behind or ahead of all the riders. Um, and so in that way, it made it very difficult for us to shoot it. And with that, it also allowed Jesse to enjoy the race, which is what he is there for. And we're trying to respect at the same time is that this guy's lived his whole life and worked so hard to get to the Iditarod, put so much money and time into this that um, it's one thing, you know, we're following him for the thousand miles across the Arctic uh, to tell our story, his story, and do a good, you know, mm -hmm. make a good episode, hopefully. But it's also out of respect for him to let him enjoy what he's actually there for. Uh, what? That, I, I wanted to ask you this earlier, so thanks for giving me a reason to do so. Yeah. That, that You've got this triple hyphenate that I was mentioning before. You know, you're outdoorsmen, you're technicians, you're artists. But you also kind of have to be diplomats because you are dealing with real people. And like some of these people are tough cookies. They, you can tell there's a reason why they live in the Arctic Circle. What? Tell me about forging those relationships. I'm sure that kind of starts with you. Sure. First, I will say, you know, watching that clip, I've seen it, I don't know hundred times by now, but it's pretty incredible. You, we ask um, these guys to go out there, film a thousand mile journey, film a TV show, and oh yeah, also film yourselves yeah. doing it for a behind the scenes, and you think it's gonna be on iPhone, but it's got <laughs> slow motion, it's got drone of themselves, sort of filming two shows at the same time. Uh, nice. You guys deserve raises, <laughs> for sure. Who's responsible uh, for that? Uh, not, uh, not me. Okay. You got that on <laughs> Can camera. Can I get this uh, recording when we're done? <laughs> get that put? It's broadcasting live. Yeah. I, maybe the, the power that be are listening. This? Yeah, that was a uh, dumb thing to say. But yeah, in terms of, in terms of the relationship with, with the cast, um, you know, it is, it is a, a, a partnership, um, 100%. Uh, initially, like you said, there, there's a reason that a lot of these people live where they live away from other people um, and society. And uh, reality TV, um, particularly Alaska reality TV, has a bad reputation. When we started filming this show, there were 12 Alaska shows happening of various kind. And uh, some of them took a lot of liberties in, in the storytelling. Kind of and condescending view, maybe. Exactly. And it took a lot of convincing that one, uh, we're BBC, and two, we're National Geographic, and those brands 
opened, uh, at least yeah. uh, softened the cast a little bit. You know, everyone grew up on National Geographic and reading yeah. National Geographic, and people realized that the, the new standard that BBC has, um, and I think that sort of allowed us that initial conversation uh, to get in there and then um, meeting them and hanging out and going to their locations. Is there a lot of that like way before you start shooting? 100% uh, and, and walking them through what we're hoping to accomplish and convincing them um, honestly that we're not like other reality shows and we're not like other Alaska shows and showing them clips and showing them what we do and explaining to them our philosophy and National Geographic's philosophy and BBC's philosophy and editorial guidelines and then ultimately um, usually they're, they're very nervous until they end up meeting uh, the guys and girls who go out there and um, become friends. Do they, do they really at a certain point just forget that you're there? Or are you like very much, are they kind of like traveling with you as pals or are you kind of trying to blend into the background? I think what happens most of the time is that they realize they, after shooting with them for the while, they kind of under, they start to understand what the show is and they soften up a little bit. And then we're such a small crew. There's four of us and one of them, and it's just us doing whatever they're doing and following it. They become a part of the crew as itself, and we, you know, really? we spend all our downtime together. We become great friends with some of them too, and I think that trust like helps them like figure out because we. We work with them very closely. They give us a lot of ideas about what to, what to do next, what to shoot next, and they get just as excited about shooting more episodes as we do. You kind of get a point. story editor out of it, basically. At the same yeah, time. yeah, they help out quite a bit. They're a great. A little too much sometimes. You know? I was going to say there's a balance in, in that, uh, <laughs> in I was that gonna, uh, input. I was going to ask, like, what was, are there times when they're like, let's do this, and you're like, that's insane. I'm not going to do that. Or... That's just boring, dude. Oh, yeah. I mean, they, they get the format down, you know? They think they're an editor all of a sudden, or <laughs> they think, like, well, this is going to be, like, the act out, you know? That, well, that was definitely the act out when the dog fell into the river, you know? It's like, no, nah, not quite, you know? But there is, like, a bit of, like, give and take where it makes them happy to feel involved as well. Yeah, sure. Um, and I think it's, and it's about the collaboration, too. And, of course, their uh, excitement in being an editor is their excitement for the show. Uh, and excitement for, or, and I think that's one of the secret sauces. Is sort of everyone is involved in the same task, which is making the best product. Um, twelve day race, thousand miles. So that's twelve days and a thousand miles of footage, Michael. Where do you start putting that thing together? So, like, what is step one? What is shot one that you're looking for? Uh, well, the beginning. No, um, <laughs> <laughs> the gun. <laughs> Uh, I no, it, uh, it, I mean, it's, once again, it's kind of when I was talking about the bear scene, it's the anticipation. You know, we can't just start with the race. We got to start with him arriving, him pulling the dogs out, um, the, the nerves, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. seeing that he's very confident, but at the same time, he's, he's definitely nervous. Yeah, he says something like a thousand, the, the line that I thought you pulled that was perfect, it's a thousand miles to numb after this or something? Yeah, well, he, I think he's saying a thousand miles to gnome, uh, which is the, the My line's the better. End. <laughs> I like your Sorry line, yeah. Like you, but I like it. It's like, it is basically a thousand miles of numb. You should save that line, that's good. <laughs> Sorry, that's how a writer thinks. I do that sometimes. But continue, um, sorry. Yeah, but uh, obviously it's a, a building up that anticipation, leading up to that very moment where they say go. Um, so that's kind of the first stuff that I was looking for. And then once he goes, it's a thousand miles, yeah. but we have to tell the story in like five scenes. Hmm. Um, that's not a lot of time. And these guys have been out there all that time, and there's so much footage to go through. Um, it, it, it takes a while, and there's a whole team of people and story producers and such that are going through this footage, and we're all trying to find like the best moments that can tell this story. Well, let's actually let's talk about one of those moments, which you call, it's the blowhole. First of all, I want to know what the blowhole is. What? It, why is it called? That? Oh, you don't want to know about the blowhole. <laughs> I do want to know about the okay, blowhole. Okay, well. Let's talk about the blowhole, <laughs> you and I. Uh, the blowhole, I didn't know what it was my first year. Everyone was just like, oh, would well, you just wait till the blowhole, you know? <laughs> if you think this is bad, wait till the blowhole. And we're like, what the hell is this blowhole, you know? Um, but it's about, I, I think it's around 750 miles into the Iditarod uh, during the route. It takes us through uh, near the Bering Sea. Um, you kind of turn this corner and all of a sudden it's just windy as all hell and it's just it's like a like a ice cold hell really um it's the windiest coldest spot 
and it's the most notorious area on the Iditarod to take riders and teams out. Uh, so the first year we got in there, it was probably around, man, we went through the morning, and we got in, and we got into that little uh, cabin that you saw. It's like a little wind shelter that they have sporadically placed throughout the Iditarod, where if you're in danger, you can sit in there. There's, if you can dig and burrow through the snow, you can find a window, because <laughs> usually it's drifted up so high um, that you can't actually, you can only see the top of the roof usually, but if you can dig in, there's like a kitchen, you can, you know, there's gas in there, you can cook. It's basically to save your life is what those shelters are for. Okay. Uh, and so that blowhole is really the most dangerous spot on the Iditarod. Um, and, and so that's why you wanted to set up there to get this moment where yeah oh because the first year was just insane it was just so windy and so cold and so dramatic looking that uh, we had set a camera inside of that shelter which when we ran away to get another shot on the trail uh, that camera I was trying to frame up had shut down because it was so cold and I missed the shot that I wanted um, so round two which we were given a second chance this year we got it it was in the night it was a bit different than I wanted but it worked I, w I was going to ask this question. Maybe you can give your version of this, Dave. Is what do you do when you've d gone to these? I mean, just being there is going to an extreme length to get a shot. And then, you you know, maybe a storm comes in or something like that, and you want to get the shot, and then technologically something happens and you just can't get it. Is there an example of that for you? The amount of nerve-wracking moments that you have in the field in those times where you're battling the cold and cameras dying because the batteries don't work at 40 below is there's so many stressful moments out there. I think hunts are the worst because you go with a certain amount of batteries and everything you need in your backpack to hunt over tundra all day and you don't know what's going to happen. You're following somebody doing a hunt. Yeah, or, as yeah. they're hunting, hunting for a moose or a bear or whatever they're going for. And you, I mean, you go through all these nightmare scenarios. It's like, okay, I have 15 minutes left on this battery. Uh, what's going to happen if there's one right there? Is that going to be enough? Should I you know, try and twitch it right now. Is there something happening right now? Is it worth missing to get this other moment just in case? It's, it's completely nerve wracking. But at the same time, once you, if you actually get it, if you nail it, it's, a, it's the most rewarding feeling in the world when you, when you get it, this, despite uh, everything. I, I want to show that there's a final clip here that you actually are featured in where it's, it seems like you're running out of everything, including batteries. Uh, I call it the stuck on an island clip. Were you actually on an island, what we're about to see? Uh, it wasn't an island per se, but we were very isolated from, from every part of civilization, for sure. All right, let's roll this. We are here to document the lives of people living in Alaska. The harsh reality is the environment we're up against. It makes it tough to do our job. Get out of there! Working on life below zero can be very dangerous. Guns here, cameras here, never know what to expect. Hey, hey. You see that? It's gonna be tough, but we're gonna get the shot. Every scenario, we gotta prepare for this. But we're still smiling, we're having fun. Still making life below zero. Yes! Bring it on. It's 9 a.m., uh, day five of our extended stay here at Chandelar. Uh, I'm still waiting for a weather window to get a plane in here. It's beautiful blue sky here, but the area in between here and where we need to get to is the problem. We're wrapped, but uh, here we remain. 13 days without plumbing or, or heat. Every day I've thought, including today, I thought there was a really good chance we would get out. Messaging back and forth via satellite to uh, to the office and you know they're, they're doing our best their best to keep us safe so I appreciate that and we just gotta wait until things are safe to get out what can you do man makes plans and God laughs so this is our gear pile staged on the beach ready to go if we get the call that the plane is coming in we're just gonna leave this out unless the weather gets really bad run pretty low on food. It's definitely getting to the point where uh, we're scraping by. Some peanut butter, this could come in handy. A couple of cans of sardines. That's about it. Probably at about two or three days of food left. We moved into Glenn's sod house. It's got an open door and then a hole in the roof. Dragged our tarp over here to kind of close up the roof hole a little bit to keep a bit more of the heat in. We'd set up cots, but just barely fit in the open space in there. And it's been a pretty great little home. 
So here's our door. Uh, keep the heat in at night. It takes a little bit of gymnastics uh, to get out in the middle of the night without making a lot of noise and waking up your mates, but it keeps the heat in really well. We need some wood to keep our sod house warm. We don't want to burn all of Glenn's wood. So we're going to go out into the forest and get some. It'll keep us warm later, and it'll warm us up right now and give us something to do. Well, you want a standing dead tree, so you're looking for one that doesn't have any uh, green needles on it. it. Doesn't seem like it's green at all. It seems like it's dead. We could try for that one. I think we could take that down. I think it'd be fun. Guy's a human beaver. Starting to have a little concern about it falling the other way. We'll see what happens. Yeah, I think it wants to go the other way. It's almost ready to go, Tony. Get out of there. Yeah. We got firewood. So now that we've dropped this tree on the ground, we need to cut it up into manageable pieces. We're about a quarter mile from the sod house right here. So um, we're gonna have to just carry them on our shoulders. We don't wanna cut them too big. We don't wanna cut them too small because that means more cuts and more trips. So we'll just take a guess at what the right length is and uh, cut it up into some chunks. Warm you up for sure. You know what they say, Tony, wood warms you twice. We've got the tree cut up into four usable chunks that I think we can manage to carry out of here on our own. So we'll do true trips. We'll throw them up on our shoulders, walk them out. Good job, that was fun. Yeah, it was, thank you. All right, should do us for a while. Thanks for getting all that wood, Notch. Yeah, that was a fun project. Uh, good group effort. It's getting colder every night and having all this wood is a, it's a killer thing to do. I mean, not only is it like it's keeping us warm in here, for one thing, for sure, but just having something to do is trapped in this sort of weird limbo that we're in, uh, you know, waiting, waiting, waiting for a new message from production, a new message from our friends or family, and just uh, trying to find something to do in the meantime to fill time. One of my favorite things about spending an extended period of time out in the backcountry is it really gives you an appreciation for all the things that we can kind of take for granted. Food is a huge part of that for the crew. I am very, very excited. It smells amazing. <laughs> all right. First, I gotta ask, Dave, am I reading this correctly? Your buddies went and shot down a tree and you <laughs> photographed exactly. it? Is that what happened? Uh, someone might have been filming them at the time. <laughs> you don't really see that from watching that. Did you draw oh, hey the guys, long thanks, straw, yeah. basically? Hey guys, thanks for going, uh, doing all the work. It's nice. <laughs> poking at the fire. I'm uh, cold. You guys go get wood, all right? <laughs> oh. Oh. Yeah. Um, I, the, uh, let's talk about the food that happened there at the end. I, I guess my question is like, what, when you come out of the tundra, what is the first food that you were like, oh, thank God, I'm back? Oh, definitely fast food, I think, just looking for Really? It. Yeah, I'm just ready, after eating all that salty, uh, that salty stuff, all I want is more salt, I think sometimes, just a, a nice burger or something, I'll stand in a line, I don't mind, I'm just happy to be around people, and, and that again, it's nice, getting back to civilization, I feel like I'm home. Is that, is that basically all you're eating out there? 
the, those kind of MRI. No, types that was a that was a extraneous circumstances. That's um, we have those MREs or the the mountain MREs, house uh, when for when we get a weather delay or something, and we had been stuck there for about five days, and we're actually running out of food. Um, it's getting a little confusing. I, the hardest part. I, What's frustrating is this shows like a little bit about where we were. It was so beautiful and clear and mm -hmm. all those shots. And every day we'd wake up and he'd hear that there was terrible weather elsewhere where we couldn't see that was keeping us from getting out. And yeah. our food would go down and it would get cold every night. And we're just hoping it doesn't snow and cover us in a foot of snow before we leave because we don't have the gear for it. But what are you, you were telling me behind the scenes, or you can talk to this too, that like the food's actually pretty damn good. But I think I would say that the, the safety managers would be horrified to, to see that, that that's what they're, is represented that they're eating a bag of Extenuating circumstances. I want to emphasize that. Extenuating they, they take circumstances. Pride, of course, the number one thing is, is safety, but their other job is, is cooking uh, for them out there. And it's the not, safety guides? Yes. And uh, they, they sort of... Um, challenge themselves, I guess, to how, how they can make the most gourmet meal uh, in, the middle, uh, in the middle of nowhere. And um, you can speak to their meals, but they do a yeah. fantastic job. Yeah, I was going to say, in fact, we try to even uh, make it more of a competition by sending the other safety guides on other teams pictures of what we're eating with our <laughs> safety guide so that they just constantly try to one-up each other. And then the next leg out, we get even better food. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Uh, I was told that I need to ask you while we're on the subject of food and drink and because we're gonna break soon I think to get some drink uh, something called a Yukon Lada but what is that it's a special treat that you get if you work with uh, Andy Bassich on the Yukon River um, he has a tradition every year he lives on the Yukon River in a floodplain and every year he runs the risk of the Yukon it ices out and that ice might dam up and block a whole bunch of water and flood his entire house. It's happened to him before, before the show is on, and every year we film with him doing it, and it's a huge danger for him. But if he makes it out of it, he celebrates with uh, with a yucalata, uh, pina colada that he makes with some river ice from the broken up Yukon. And did you did you have any? I did. I did partake after we <laughs> after we filmed uh, and wrapped for the day. It was delicious. Uh, you know, just a. Uh, it's a nice thing to you know that everybody's safe and we can take a time to just relax for a little bit. He can as well. I mean, he's the one sure. losing his house. And you only had one, right? Yeah, just one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's fine. Um, I guess uh, last question. We, we saw a whole bunch of stuff. I mean, like, obviously you have your camera gear. You've got the food that's being brought along and apparently multiple kinds of saws and axes. Just a list of the kind of gear that you have to get hauled into this situation? I think it varies quite a bit from whatever leg we're doing. So we, we followed some pretty crazy stuff out into the field, I think. Sometimes the runs to hardware stores before we go out, depending on the story, is very, very different. I think on well, average, what, you're, you're flying out to where there 40 something cases of, of camera gear. And you got gears, four people? With four people for about two to three weeks. I think our record, my record was 57 cases, something like that. But yeah, every, every leg's different. You know, each one, you know, you need something different per story. The Iditarod, of course, is completely out there. I mean, we're purchasing snowmobiles with cases that we're building off the side and holsters for tripods, you know, and things to last a thousand miles. So that's going to be very different than going to Glenn's, like his story there. You know, it's going to consist mostly of a lot of food and, you know, maybe some hardware like chainsaws or extra, extra tools that they might need when they're camping. Like I said, you really work for your living. Uh, thanks so much for doing what you do. Do we have we have like five minutes left? Should we take a few questions from sure. the audience? Does anybody have? Oh, right away in the front. Minnesota, yeah, Minnesota man. <laughs> Go for it. I'm curious. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm curious about <clears throat> me, the safety guy. Uh, if something really bad is about to happen, other than making sure he's the slowest runner on the team. <laughs> <laughs> What do you do to make sure he'll do his job and just not panic? We, you know, we, uh, the, like I always, you know, shout out to National Geographic and BBC Studios who makes this, but the production company BBC takes safety extremely, extremely, extremely um, seriously. And uh, there's a, a vetting process for uh, these guys who are the safety managers out there and a protocol that they put in place. Um, they have to, uh, you know, have uh, background checks and gun checks and safety checks and a whole uh, variety of resumes to get that job, um, uh, and it's uh, a very important one. Does that answer my question? 
Do they? I think the question was, do they run slow? Do we try to make them run <laughs> slow? Uh, no, but I, I do think these these safety people would sacrifice themselves for for their crew. Absolutely. Um, I would say that we we after all our years working in the field in Alaska are maybe honorary Alaskans, but these guys, these safety managers, are real Alaskans, and they've been there, they've seen it, they've done a ton of work, and we have the utmost faith in them, and that allows us to do our job and do it well every time. Next, oh, we have somebody back there. Does it? Uh, yes. Hi, you mentioned that there's um, women on some of the crews, and I just wondered what their role was. Mm. Uh, all the roles. Um, uh, uh, the question was, uh, I guess, if there are women. That there are women on the crew and what their roles are. Yeah, uh, women um, have at some point had, had all the roles. I think you saw in the, in the very beginning. Um, she says she has the coolest job She in the does, world. yeah. Crofton has <laughs> been on our show since, uh, since day one, and she was the very first producer to go out to Sue's location. And uh, at the time, it was my job to talk to her on the phone. And I, I do recall one of my favorite conversations with her is like, what the hell did you get me into? <laughs> Why did I sign up for this? But absolutely, 100%, yeah, there's uh, uh, women have all the roles on the show. And of course, Sue is like a major character on the show who is a badass. Um, <laughs> any, right there, perhaps? Oh, thanks. Hi, um, I've spent a considerable amount of time in Alaska in my own life, so I'm very interested in uh, your comments about trying to, to respect the people who are there, and I'm kind of interested how you prepared yourself to really understand the culture and the kind of people that live in Alaska before you started your work. Uh, uh, for all of us, or sure. Uh, for me, it was just researching as much as I could about Alaska before I went to Alaska, watching um, old, well, National Geographic documentaries, uh, sort of more pure documentaries, understanding uh, that, that Alaska uh, feel. You know, I always tell people that I can tell that we have a good show, because when, you, when we tell an Alaskan, oh, uh, you know, I work on Life Below Zero, their response is usually like, oh, okay, which is high praise <laughs> for an Alaska, an Alaskan to talk about an Alaskan reality TV show that would not be as, uh, as uh, you know, I'm yeah. not going to ask you to tell us what would happen if they didn't like the show. Yes. <laughs> uh, right there. Um, yeah, I know you use a lot of remote cameras. I won't say brands like GoPro or anything, but what percentage of that footage, digital footage, ends up on the show, and what percentage overall of the footage makes it into an hour-ish episode? That's a good um, question for you, yeah. Well, uh, I mean, I would say the thing is there's multiple cameras. They got GoPro footage. They got slow motion. They got aerials. There's time lapse. Like there's, uh, for one day, you could have, you know, 20, 30 hours of footage of all these different camera angles. Um, so, yeah, it, it, the percentage-wise, you know, I mean, you could do the math, but... You know, I want to say something like 5% of it actually ends up on the screen. Um, and it's, it's us going through all this footage and, and trying to find... It, it's so tough, because these guys shoot such great footage. Like, like just chopping down the tree, it's like, yeah, look at that saw going through yes. that. Yes, and, and you know, I'm, I'm looking at the screen and I'm going... <laughs> Holy shit! <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing. There's there's pieces of wood thrown, you know, they're flying in my face, and and you got to leave um, it on the floor sometimes. We we there are some things that we have to cut just because we unfortunately don't have the time, and I I hate telling these guys this because I get the cold stare, <laughs> you know. It's like, what is it, what do you is know how many hours I put into, you know, getting that shot? Yeah, either uh, any three of you, tell me what the shot is that it's like that. Seriously, that didn't go in the show. I I, I nearly lost a foot for that oh man <laughs> there's there's a lot if there, you want there to really fight, is yeah there's one i was at uh, andy's house and he had this giant burn pile uh and i i went in there i just put on these like stupid safety goggles as if it was gonna like really help <laughs> and i went in with our slow motion camera and i like ran into the fire as he was throwing something to get it like hitting and getting the sparks coming out and, and then i ran out and as i ran out i didn't realize he had like a little uh like bottle of aerosol somewhere in like one of the in the bags that just like blew up and it went right by the camera and it ended up being the most epic shot I ever have like I keep it on my phone it's like one of the number one things on my favorites I'm like check this shot out and then that episode came out and it wasn't there and I was like you've got to be kidding me like, I was like 
Oh, you're like, wait, how did Michael, that Michael, what do you have to say for yourself? No comment. It All was a right. different editor. The great thing about the show, though, is that, you know, a lot of those shots get used later on. Um, so there's a lot of flash forwards, flashbacks um, to memories and things that happened. So, you know, I actually ended up seeing that like two or three years down the line in a flashback where he was talking about how he has to get rid of his trash, um, which then flashed back to this this can. <laughs> you know? See, I, I knew was, we used that can. I got it. I got it. You're like, don't lie. Um, I did, the, the last, uh, let's close it out with this. Nature. I feel like nature filmmaking has just come so far. Technologically, it's insane. I watched, you know, Planet Earth two in this show, and then I go back and watch Planet Earth one, and it's like watching, you know, cave drawings or something. And that was an amazing, amazing show. What is the next step? What could possibly blow our minds? Are you like actively working on the next thing that's going to make us insane? Uh, I mean, I All think the it. beauty of the show is that it's always pushing the next best, the next interesting thing that we can find. You know, it's kind of on us as DPs uh, to find the next tool, the next crazy camera or anything that we can bring out to, to make things even more visually appealing and unusual. You know, we're starting to use cable cams now to kind of answer one of your questions. We have a cable cam that we're using. What does that mean? Uh, it's, it's hooked to a remote, and what we're able to do is put it now instead of, you know, you get a typical drone shot, which we're now seeing pretty often on a lot of TV shows, uh, but now we've got these little cable cams hooked to, you know, like a GoPro, which on a remote can go a couple hundred yards across the trees, which will give it more of an unusual look when you see somebody hiking through the woods and you're wondering how this camera is following them through the brush, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, where a drone can't go. Um, we just recently cut down a tree with a cable cam and had that cable cam chasing the tree as it was following, or as it was following, and it hit the cable cam at the end, which you get this awesome shot of it like trailing uh, through the woods, tracking the tree falling, and then all of a sudden the camera flips over, uh, which again, better get used. Um, <laughs> that, that'll, be, that'll be in the show. Any VR, are we gonna have like below zero VR? That could be something awesome. Uh, all right. Just prepare us before that, because my <laughs> mind's going to explode. Let's give these guys a big round of applause. Thank you so much, and thanks for the show. And thank you all for being here. And stick around. I think we can, there's still a bartender back there. So stick around, and these guys will talk to you, too. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.